The Raspberry Pi 400 is the latest device in the Raspberry Pi line of all-in-one computers. It takes the concept of being an all-in-one even further than their previous devices by combining the design of the official Raspberry Pi keyboard with a purpose-built mainboard to create a single device. I ordered the kit version, which retails for about $100 US and includes the Raspberry Pi 400 as well as some accessories. Here we have the unit itself. It sports a red and white color scheme and it doesn't look much bigger than other keyboards of this format. On the back of the unit we have an exposed 40 pin GPIO, a microSD slot preloaded with a 16 gig microSD card that already has Raspberry Pi OS installed on it, dual HDMI ports, a single USB-C port for power, two USB 3.0 ports, a USB 2.0 port, and a gigabit ethernet port. Notably, it has one less USB port than the original Raspberry Pi 4, but that's because one port has been repurposed for the integrated keyboard. This computer, for me, really channels a feeling of many 80s computers, which is a large part of the reason why I bought it, but more about that later. Everything was well packed in the box, and we have two smaller boxes underneath the keyboard. On the left hand side we have an official USB-C 5V 3 amp Raspberry Pi power supply, The slightly larger box on the right hand side contains our official Raspberry Pi USB 2.0 computer mouse. It's a two button mouse with a scroll wheel and it matches the red and white schema of the keyboard perfectly. Removing the bottom panel, we can find a micro HDMI to full size HDMI cable which is about three feet long. And we also get the official Raspberry Pi guidebook. The Pi 400 is solidly built and has a fairly substantial weight to it. The body feels strong and the keyboard is decent for a non-mechanical keyboard. It contains a quad-core Broadcom BCM2711 processor clocked at 1.8 GHz. And that's the fastest processor we've seen in a Pi device so far. It also has 4 gigs of RAM, dual band wireless, and support for Bluetooth 5.0. It uses a passive cooling setup which makes it completely silent. It also has the distinction of being the first device in the Raspberry Pi line of computers to include a power button, which is accessed by pressing the function key and F10. The official mouse is just okay. It sports the same red and white color scheme as the keyboard, and it's pretty light and not very ergonomic. It'll do the job, but it's certainly not going to become one of my favorite devices. Hooking up the Pi 400 is pretty simple. The Pi supports up to two displays at 4K resolutions, although running two 4K devices will greatly limit your refresh rate. For my testing, I'm connecting the Pi to a 1440p monitor, which should be more than adequate. When I booted up my Pi for the first time, it had me run some setup configuration items, basic information on my location, Wi-Fi, and other questions you'd expect a new PC to ask on first startup. After that, it spent about 20 minutes downloading and installing various updates, and I also discovered at this point that the power light also acts as an activity light for the microSD card to let you know that the unit is still doing stuff in the background. Basic browsing on the Pi 400 is what you'd expect. Websites load in a reasonable amount of time, and the Chromium browser pre-installed didn't have any issues with the websites I tested it on. Next, I decided to test some YouTube streaming. The playback wasn't fantastic. At 720p or lower, it was passable if not perfectly smooth, but at 1080p or higher, it became pretty jarring. I know from experience that most Pies are capable of running better video playback, so this may be improved with future updates. For now, if you want to do some basic streaming of content and don't care about having the highest resolutions, it'll probably do just fine. Going through the pre-installed software, I also found that Minecraft Pi Edition had already been installed. After loading it, I ran into a peculiar issue. When I tried to full screen the game, it would expand to take up the entire desktop, but it would only render the top left of the game. This issue continued even if I tried to resize the window manually, and it only ever rendered a section of the game equal to the size of the window when it opened. 
Watching locally stored 1080p video content using the pre-installed instance of VLC player delivered smooth playback. This further leads me to believe that the struggles it has with YouTube playback are more about the browser than the device. In the future, I'll test some different browsing solutions to see if we can find one that delivers a more enjoyable experience. There is also a wide variety of additional software available right from the operating system itself, and with a little bit of Linux knowledge, you can use the terminal to install even more software, making the flexibility of the Pi 400 fantastic. From there, it was time to turn my attention to the reason I ordered the unit. I wanted to see how it would handle emulating old computers. One of the great things about the Pi line of computers is that, since microSD cards are readily available and pretty affordable, you can easily just have a bunch of different cards for different purposes and swap them back and forth as your needs change. I dug out a 32GB microSD card and jumped over to the RetroPie website to download the latest image, which has support for the Pi 400. Installation setup went exactly as you would expect on other Pis. I decided to pair my Pi 400 with the USB Commodore 64 controller that came with my C64 Mini because it felt like the perfect companion piece for my setup. I also brought out my 8 bit SNES controller for additional console emulation since the Pi 400 has integrated Bluetooth support. I used the additional package manager from the RetroPie install to install support for Commodore 64 games and, after messing around with the controller configuration, the USB controller worked flawlessly. The integrated keyboard made emulation for the Commodore 64 perfect. One of my biggest complaints about the C64 Mini is the fact that the keyboard's all for show and non-functional. This just makes me realize how much cooler a device it could have been if the keyboard actually worked. Ghostbusters played perfectly on it. From the music to the sound effects, everything came out nice and clear. I also spent some time playing Maniac Mansion, which plays pretty much exactly as I remember it. Apple II emulation was likewise flawless. In fact, this review ended up being pushed an extra day because I got too distracted playing Oregon Trail. Before I realized it, several hours had passed and I had died of dysentery. I'll be testing more games in the future, but for now this seems like it's a match made in heaven. I also tried ZX Spectrum emulation. While all the games loaded okay and I was able to get it to recognize keyboard input, I haven't gotten it working flawlessly yet. The emulator uses a lot of keyboard commands to change configuration items, such as the spacebar activating and deactivating fast forward mode. I think it'll work well once all the configuration issues are ironed out, but for now, out of the box, it's not perfect. Finally, it was time to see how well it would handle early PC emulation. DOSBox is included out of the box with RetroPie, so I started to load it up with some key pieces of software from my original 386. Windows 3.11 installed in DOSBox without any issues. I was even able to install a graphics driver to give it high resolution support, and telling Windows that it had a Sound Blaster 16 installed worked just fine. And I was even able to get the Microsoft Best of Entertainment package to install. Games like the Commander Keen series emulated very well, although the support for my joystick was a little hit or miss. In some Keen games, it worked fine, but in others, it couldn't find the center of the joystick, which resulted in Keen constantly walking to the right when he should have been standing still. Moving through more advanced games, the Pi was able to tackle Wolfenstein 3D with no issues. The joystick worked better here, or at least as well as joysticks ever worked with this game. For most first-person shooters, I prefer to stick with straight keyboard or a combination of keyboard and mouse. The story was similar with Doom, with gameplay being nice and smooth and the audio sounding nice and clear. Duke Nukem 3D installed and configured just like it used to on my old 486, and it was even able to support the higher graphics VESA modes running at 800 by 600.
The most advanced game I installed on here was Quake, which ran fine at default resolutions, but became less smooth at some higher resolutions. At 640x400, the game was smooth enough that I would leave it there, as there was a huge improvement graphically over the default 320x240. Now the next part of my testing seemed pretty pointless, but any excuse to play some more video games is good enough for me. Basic console emulation works as well on the Pi 400 as it has on all other Pi 4 devices. I tried Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, NES, and SNES, and they all worked exactly as you'd expect. The 8 Do Bluetooth controller is the perfect companion for this setup as well, it feels just like an original SNES controller. Overall, the Raspberry Pi 400 is an awesome addition to the Raspberry Pi lineup. With its slightly faster processor, integrated keyboard, and compact design, it can be stuck anywhere, making it the perfect lightweight browsing machine, emulation station, or educational computer. The base unit is $70, but for $30 more, you get not only the keyboard, but also the mouse, the power supply, the HDMI cable, the micro SD card, and the guidebook. It's definitely a great addition to the Pi collection, and I'm looking forward to building some projects around it in the future.